afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many questions and answers in as possible, I'd be grateful if there could be. Jackson Carlock. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the Cabinet Secretary's position is on the performance of the A and E Department at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, Glasgow. Secretary Shunan. Well, despite improvements over the summer, the level of variation in performance at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital A&E is unacceptable. The National Unscheduled Care Team continue to work closely with the local team on a number of improvement initiatives to ensure continuous improvement going forward. Figures published yesterday for the week ending the 8th of November shows a 2.5% point improvement compared to the previous week to 88.6%. The board has suggested that performance in the latest week, the week ending the 15th of November, has significantly improved compared to recent weeks, but progress cont continues towards a sustainable improvement, which is now required. Jackson Carlo. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. You know, the performance at the Queen Elizabeth A&E has regrettably been a constant source of concern since this 842 million flagship hospital opened. Before the summer requests, the summer recess, two requests for me for a statement were declined. Uh, and I was then directed when we returned in September to an answer given to Bob Doris when I had the temerity to raise the issue. You know, despite the hardworking efforts of staff, performance continues to be poor and it was compounded, as I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary knows, by the inexcusable death of an elderly man left languishing in a trolley. Cabinet Secretary, my West of Scotland constituents now it's redirected to the Queen Elizabeth following the closure of the more easily reached Victoria Infirmary, find themselves in a vastly superior facility, but with an inferior service. They've heard the warm words, added to, to this the question, week, please, with Mr. promises Carlo. of achievement of targets and improved services by the spring, by the spring. But this summer, similar promises came to nothing. What they want to know now is not that everything is being done, but specifically what exactly is being done both by the Health Board and the Cabinet Secretary. Can she tell us? Cabinet Secretary. Okay, well, first of all, um, it is absolutely essential that that new flagship hospital, as uh, Jackson Carlow describes it, um, performs well, not just at the c &E department, but across the whole hospital. Uh, I can confirm that staff are working very, very hard uh, to achieve that, and I can confirm that the support team has continued to work, and of course an answer was given about the work of that support team uh, over the summer. Um, Jackson Carlow, though, mentioned the immediate assessment unit, which is not the same as the A&E department, but a very important component of the new hospital. And I absolutely deeply regret the death, death of the elderly gentleman on a trolley. That is unacceptable. And of course, a full review um, into his treatment has been initiated. And that's very important that that happens. What I can say, though, is that further developments around that immediate assessment unit have been um, taken forward. So as of this week, there is a new ambulatory care area capable of seeing 10 patients at a time and there's going to be an alternative location for the assessment of uh, surgical and neurology patients, which again has started this week. I visited the assessment unit this morning and the ambulatory uh, service and I can tell him that staff are working very, very hard to make these changes and indeed the improvements from those changes are already visible. But I can assure Jackson Carlaw and anyone else in this chamber that I take a daily interest in this issue because it is important that that hospital performs as it should be and the staff need to be supported in being able to deliver that. Richard Simpson. Yes, uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply? And I don't think any of us have any doubt that she's going to try and be on top of this. And we also, no one has any doubt this staff is working very hard. But the continuing problem with the a &E unit does seem to indicate it is under-resourced. Uh, there just isn't enough space or staff or time to actually get patients through. And in addition to that, we now know there are 13 similar immediate assessment units under various names across Scotland, which are not being subject to the a &E waiting time. So, you know, we really need to have a very clear explanation, the public require a very clear explanation as to what's going on. Will the Cabinet Secretary provide that uh, in the form of a statement of what's actually going on? Uh, uh, because there are no longer teething problems with this hospital. There are serious issues which may have long-term effects. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Richard Simpson again conflated two things, the A&E unit and the, the immediate assessment unit. So let's talk about the immediate assessment unit. Um, Glasgow have said very clearly 
that it needs to be bigger than the, the modelling that was done. They've been quite clear about that and therefore they're taking steps um, immediately to um, create the ambulatory care area and uh, the other changes that I mentioned earlier in order to free up some capacity but they are also expanding the size of the unit which they have um, been given to mid-December to do so they are doing that in order that that unit uh, has the size that it requires so it's not about the not enough staff um, at A&E it's about the size of the immediate assessment unit not being big enough and not having the capacity that is being acted upon and will be changed. Richard Simpson then mentioned about the units um, which, as he says, have grown up across Scotland in different ways um, over many years. And uh, are, he's right, they're not subject to the four-hour target. He will be aware, hopefully, um, that the Royal College of Physicians have already begun work over the last few months with the Scottish Government to look at those units of whether we can bring a standardisation uh, and to look at how we ensure <coughs> performance is monitored and indeed that patient safety uh, is at the forefront of all of that. That work is ongoing and when it concludes I would be more than happy uh, to uh, inform Parliament of that in whatever way makes the most sense. If we're going to get through the questions, we need to have short questions and answers. Please, question two, Jimmy D. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with NHS Lothian regarding the private finance initiative contract at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. Can I have a uh, Scottish Government officials meet regularly with NHS Lothian staff to discuss a range of finance and infrastructure topics. The management of the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh contract is a responsibility of NHS Lothian. Any particular issues relating to the contract uh, can be discussed in this forum. But since April, NHS Lothian have been working to develop and consider a range of options for the improvement of the contract for, uh, for the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh and officials are supporting NHS Lothian in these efforts. Jim, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I welcome the Scottish mm -hmm. Government's ongoing commitment to work with NHS Lothian to improve the cost effectiveness and transparency of a PFI contract which is widely believed to be against the public interest. I am aware that part of the process of identifying savings was the establishment of an expert review group at the hospital who would carry out a full financial health check mm -hmm. of the contract's current and retrospective performance. Would you be able to provide me with an update of this health check and if any further savings have been identified for the benefit of the taxpayer. Can I say? Well, I'm certainly aware of the, the members' concerns and interest about the contract for uh, this hospital and he can be assured that I share his concerns and the support um, and support NHS Lothian's work to make those improvements. They have established a group to identify and examine a, a full range of options around the future management and operation uh, of the PFI contract with the goal of improving value for money. In this work, they're being supported by officials and by the Scottish Futures Trust. The focus is on a long-term improvement in the performance and value for money of the services delivered through the PFI contract rather than simply achieving savings in the short term. The board is actively investigating ways in which the contract might be improved and has uh, strengthened the in-house management arrangements. Um, proposals brought forward by the group will be given full consideration in terms of affordability, value for money and the benefits that that will deliver and I'm happy to keep the member informed about that. Many thanks. Question three in the name of Neil Bibby has not been lodged. An explanation has however been provided. Question four, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason the drug Affinita is not available on the NHS in Scotland for the treatment of breast cancer. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Medicines Consortium provides advice to NHS Scotland on newly licensed medicines. The independence of the SMC decisions on individual drugs is well established. The SMC did not recommend a very must, sorry about that, for breast cancer due to uncertainties surrounding the overall clinical benefit the medicine would provide for patients taken against the price charged for the drug. As the member will be aware, SMC are expecting a resubmission from the pharmaceutical company for this drug. Cameron Buchanan. I thank the Cameron Secretary for that answer. It is a matter of great concern to my constituents as they have to travel south to get certain treatments on the NHS, including Affinita. Have any steps been taken to ensure that this does not happen? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, can I say to the member that um, there are different decisions made sometimes around drug availability by NICE um, and SMC. So sometimes NICE 
do not approve drugs that are available in Scotland. Uh, we base our decision making around what the SMC advise, but I would remind the member that we also have a £90 million new medicines fund which has been established for absolutely the purpose of being able to get or orphan and ultra-orphan drugs uh, into um, the, the, the hands of patients and indeed that even where the SMC has not approved um, a, a drug for wide-scale use there is still the opportunity for the patient uh, to apply uh, through the, um, the, the, the in individual uh, uh, treatment uh, patient pathway. Um, so finally I should just remind the member we are reviewing the SMC and the views of patients around um, these issues will be very important as we take that review forward. Many thanks. Question five, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure access to GP services in the Mid Scotland and Fife region. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, under the legal framework for service provision, NHS boards are responsible for ensuring the provision of primary medical services for their areas. NHS Fife works with GP practices to ensure that everyone in Fife has access to GP services. Thank you. Claire Baker. Um, I have written to the Cabinet Secretary recently regarding the Canon Surgery and Methyl, which has recently been taken over by NHS Fife due to a failure to recruit two principal GPs. Um, Kirkcaldy is also experiencing severe pressure with eight surgeries now closing their list to patients. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary say how much of the additional £60 million announced in June will be supporting GP services in Fife? And also in her recent reply to me, she said they were developing short-term recruitment initiatives. Um, can she tell me what discussions she's had with NHS Fife to make progress on this? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I recently um, discussed a number of issues with the chair of NHS uh, Fife. I can assure Claire Baker that uh, we are absolutely determined through the investment of the £60 million to tackle some of these recruitment and retention issues. Some of those are more medium to long term as we uh, encourage more uh, young doctors into general practice. But in the meantime, we are absolutely doing everything we can through recruitment and retention initiatives to attract uh, people who, for example, may have left uh, the profession but could uh, be encouraged back. Uh, those who um, are uh, looking uh, for uh, positions within the health service here in Scotland. We are offering um, opportunities for GPs and others to come and work here in the NHS and we are looking at every opportunity to promote that. What I would say though is where uh, surgeries, she mentioned the one in methyl, have been taken over by the board. I mean it's not uncommon for boards to do that uh, to ensure continuity of service to patients and it shouldn't be viewed as a negative thing if boards are taking over practices to make sure that continuity of service continues. Um, but I accept as Claire Baker I'm sure has heard me say before that we have a lot more to do to make sure that sustainability of GP services whether that's in Fife or elsewhere in Scotland um, is taken forward and we are determined to do that. Many thanks. Jim Hume. Uh, th th thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary recently wrote to me stating there is an increasing awareness of practices facing sustainability challenges across Scotland, including the Mid-Scotland and Fife region. Six health boards have seen decreases in GP numbers since 2007, and we face a shortage of 900 GPs in the next 10 years. I would like uh, more detail from the Scottish Government today how they can guarantee that rural and remote areas like Mid-Scotland and Fife will not be disproportionately affected by GP shortages. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm sure Jim Hume will be aware of all of the discussions we are having around um, making general practice more attractive. So the new contract discussions that are underway, we are looking at a transition year with a major dismantling of the co arrangements in advance of a new contract being uh, put in place and of course new models of primary care, all of which are designed to encourage uh, people to, young doctors to choose general practice as an option. Um, and you know, we will look at what other um, mechanisms or methods that we require in order to um, 
to take general practice into a place where it is actually the, the choice of young doctors and we're looking at how we um, expand access to medicine. We also, of course, have just um, expanded the GP training places by a third. So you know, we are doing a lot of comprehensive work around this. Some of it, though, will take a bit longer than others to deliver, but you can, can be assured we are absolutely giving us a top priority. Many thanks. Bob Doris, question six. Thanks, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is seeking to enhance community optometry services in the Glasgow region. Minister Maureen Watt. General of Ophthalmic Services describes the national arrangements for the provision of high street optometric services, <coughs> including since 2006 the provision of free eye examinations for people living in Scotland. Where appropriate, NHS boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, can use shared service arrangements to tailor service provision in their area to suit local needs, such as rebalancing service provision from acute centres to high street optometrists. Many more patients are now being treated within the community, with optometrists being able to manage the treatment of certain eye conditions such as glaucoma. This is supported by a recent investment of 1.5 million, providing every community optometrist with a pachymeter, a device which will help to better refine referrals for glaucoma and ocular hypertension and enabling more patients to be retained and managed in the community in line with the Scottish Government's 2020 vision. Many thanks. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. She did indeed mention the redesign of services in Glasgow so that my constituents can get speedier and more effective treatment in the acute sector where, where necessary. Does the Minister agree with me that it's important that my constituents know that their first port of call for eye care treatment should be the community optometrist, therefore taking pressure off the acute sector but also making sure that they get a quality treatment in their local community for their eye health, and that we should raise awareness of this to make sure everyone is as informed as possible to uh, see the most appropriate allied health professional for their health care needs. Minister. Yes, the Scottish Government is committed to providing a first-class community-based eye health care service in Scotland. Treating more patients in the community is, as I said, entirely uh, consistent with our 2020 vision. Community optometrists are better placed than ever to manage a wide range of conditions in the community. For example, the provision of NHS prescribing pads is allowing an increasing number of optometrists in Scotland to treat acute eye conditions. And a third of all the independent prescribing optometrists in, Scot in the UK are in Scotland. Thanks so much. Question seven, Nigel Don. Being officer to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent World Health Organisation report on the carcinogenicity of red and processed meat. Minister Maureen Watt. We welcome the latest report from the WHO. The report classes the consumption of red meat as probably carcinogenic to humans and the consumption of processed meat as carcinogenic to humans. The findings are broadly in line with the recommendations of the 2000, in 2010 from the Independent UK Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition, uh, which recommends that we limit in intakes of red and processed meat to more than, no more than 70 grams a day. Scotland's dietary goal for red meat and processed meat is based on the latest evidence from the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition's report, which is called Iron and Health. This reflects the links between high consumption of processed meat and certain cancers, which recognise that red meat is a good source of nutrients and can be consumed as part of a healthy, balanced diet. Thank you. Nigel Dunn. Thank the Minister for that reply. In view of the additional advice from the World Health Organisation that studies show a higher risk of colorectal cancer in people eating a diet low in vegetables, legumes and whole cereals, does the Minister agree that we need to heed the overall collected advice about a healthy diet and recognise the value of vegetable consumption and a high fibre diet generally? Minister. Yes, and I recognise the members' uh, continuing interest uh, in this area and it's correct that we need to look at the overall, of, overall balance of the diet. Food Standards Scotland advise eating a healthy, balanced diet including plenty of fruit, vegetables and starchy carbohydrates, as well as eating some dairy foods and some meat, fish or vegetarian alternatives, and at the same time, as we know, avoiding foods high in fat, sugar and salt. The Scottish Government is taking a range of action to improve diet. We are spending over £10 million in the four years to 2016 on projects to encourage healthy eating, 
These include our Eat Better, Feel Better campaign, which will launch its next phase in January and include advice on how to affordably increase fruit, veg and fibre intake. Nimara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We know from the evidence from academics and at the Cancer Conference this Monday that the, the public health campaigns are, are, are valuable but don't hit um, our populations that suffer the most health inequalities. Minister, given that 40% of cancers are preventable, what specific action is the Scottish Government taking on diet and public health? Cabinet. Well, in Minister. my previous answer, I gave an, an example of some of the um, uh, uh, ways in which we are trying to improve um, <clears throat> the country's health. I recognise, as the member suggests, that there is still inequality in relation to uh, those suffering from cancer, but the figures, as she mentioned, are going in the right direction, but we always know that more can and will be needed to be done. So much. Question 8, Patricia Ferguson. To ask the Scottish Government what assistance is available for GP practices that encounter problems regarding staffing levels. Secretary. Over the next three years, the Scottish Government will invest £60 million as part of the primary care fund to address immediate workload and recruitment issues in primary care and put in place long-term sustainable change to support GPs and improve access to services for patients. As part of this, £2.5 million will be invested in work to explore with key stakeholders the issues surrounding GP recruitment and retention. This investment is beginning the process of finding new ways of working, helping to address the problems of recruitment and retention that are common to primary care services across the UK and beyond. Thank you very much. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. We have explored in this chamber on a number of occasions now the particular issue of the deep end practices and particularly the Balmore practice in my constituency. What action is the Cabinet Secretary going to, do, going to take rather, to assist a practice like Balmore that has now been reviewed by Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board and has been told that it will have further help to review its processes and to help with, and I quote, lean working, whatever that might be. These practices need help now, and money that's being invested in the future is not going to help them out of immediate crisis. So what action can be taken to assist them now? Thanks very much, Cabinet Secretary. Well, I mean, I, th I think it would be um, unfair to suggest that there's not been any support given to the Balmore practice. I mean, I have a list here of the support that is being provided, the practice is being provided with three additional doctor sessions per week um, in order to provide the headroom to engage in a comprehensive review package involving several other professionals groups uh, in, in order to better understand the underlying reasons for this situation. The practice review support team involves, among others, an experienced GP um, and uh, other clinical uh, support. I also am aware that the um, the Health Board have been again in discussions with Balmore around uh, extending the support um, for the practice into the new year. Um, and, uh, you know, the Board has no interest in leaving the practice in a, a, a fragile state and wants to continue to work with the practice in supporting them. On her wider point, Patricia Ferguson raises issues that I've um, spoken to her uh, about before in this chamber and that is the new contract I think does provide an opportunity to ensure that it better recognises the needs of practices working in areas of deprivation more than the current contract does and that's something I'm very keen uh, to take forward but meantime I will be keeping a very close eye on the communications between Glasgow and Balmore and it's important that that uh, leads to the practice uh, being sustainable not just in the short term but uh, going forward as well. Many thanks Bob Doris. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for meeting with myself in relation to recruitment and retention problems at Balmore Practice in Postle Park? Can I welcome that GP locum support will now be extended into January, but can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to, as I have done, urge Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board to extend that support through to the end of March to support the practice at the height of its winter pressures and provide it the breathing space so that a long-term solution can be found? Yeah, well, I will certainly uh, continue to have discussions with Glasgow, as I um, intimated to Bob Doris, both when I met him and indeed today, that uh, 
Um, I want Glasgow to do what they can to support the Balmore practice. It should be said that there are other practices in the area that are actually performing very, very well indeed, that Glasgow is also in communication with. So um, it's not fair to say that there are um, all of the practices within that area are having the same challenges. Balmore has challenges that are particular to Balmore and I think it's important to recognise that and that is why it's important that Glasgow do support this practice. We want this practice to succeed. We want it to be a success and I will certainly be encouraging Glasgow as far as I can to do all they can to support the practice through the winter and beyond that. Thanks so much. Question nine, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what the success rate is of the treatment of pancreatic cancer and whether it will provide an update in progress with research. Secretary. We know that the outlook for those diagnosed with pancreatic cancer remains poor in comparison with other cancers. In Scotland, uh, the age standardised five year relative survival for men is approximately 3.6%, and for women, it's approximately 5.5%. In research, Scotland is currently the only part of the UK whose government is specifically co-funding research into pancreatic cancer along with a charity. Our Chief Scientist Office and Pancreatic Cancer UK each committed £75,000 to fund two Scottish-led projects submitted to the Research Innovation Fund and I was delighted to confirm at the pancreatic cancer event at the Scottish Parliament uh, yesterday that this co-funding arrangement is to be extended for a further year. That will make almost £400,000 available to fund research in Scotland on pancreatic cancer. Thank you very much. Willie Coffey. Thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? She's clearly aware that survival rates from this disease lag far behind survival rates uh, of other cancers particularly when measured over the one and five year survival rate period. We know that early detection of cancer is vital, but with this particular cancer, it is particularly difficult. Would you consider how we might make some further progress in this, either by public education, via screening, or indeed further research? Secretary. Last night at the, the event, uh, I was speaking to clinicians and patients, and I was very struck by the importance of detecting this cancer early. That's not an easy thing to do because of the nature of the symptoms of this disease. But those patients who had survived, um, it was very much because this cancer had been detected early. That's why research is very, very important. And the uh, resources I uh, mentioned in my first answer will, will help. Uh, we are well placed to be a leader for research into pancreatic cancer. The Stratified Medicine Scotland Innovation Centre, based at the new uh, hospital, is an example of a Scotland-wide uh, initiative that will allow many diseases to be studied in the population at the molecular level. And the new cancer plan um, that we uh, are working on with stakeholders now, uh, I hope will help to, to gather some of these issues for pancreatic cancer and other cancers in how we take that forward over the next five to 10 years. Thanks. Question 10, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to tackle NHS workforce challenges in rural areas. Cabinet Secretary. We recognise the particular challenges faced by NHS boards in securing a sustainable workforce for the future in remote and rural areas. The Scottish Government is supporting a number of initiatives to help uh, address this. We're working with boards to sustain services in remote and rural hospitals by developing networks with urban hospitals. In some areas, this involves rotating staff between them. Through the Being Here programme, the Scottish Government is funding new primary care approaches in four NHS Highland sites. And NHS Education Scotland has developed rural fellowships to give qualified GPs the opportunity to work in rural areas and develop the generalist skills required to work in those areas. Much, Graham Day. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As she knows, the NHS Tayside 2020 Vision document seeks to increase delivery of health services in rural settings. However, projected population change figures for Angus up to 2037, uh, 2037 predict a marked downturn in the number of residents from that age range that the NHS would recruit staff from, yet a sizable increase in the number of over 75s, the age group most likely to require health services. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether the Scottish Government is aware of the demographics challenge which, at least in Tayside terms, is peculiar to Angus and what measures might be taken to tackle this? Cabinet Secretary. 
Yes, uh, we are aware of that and we expect uh, NHS board workforce planners, including those in NHS Tayside, to take full account of local factors, including the demographic issues uh, referred to by Graham Day, uh, preparing workforce plans and projections uh, as they are required to do. We're working with HR directors and those workforce planners and boards to support, a, I suppose, a more consistent, uh, sustained approach to national NHS workforce data and intelligence, ensuring not only enough staff, but they're in the right place doing the right thing at the right time. And uh, I'm sure that will help to address some of the concerns that uh, Graham Day has uh, for parts of, of his constituency. Briefly, Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that professional recognition and pay often depends on the depth of knowledge a clinician has, or indeed a med member of the medical team has, rather than the breadth of knowledge that they have, which is often required in rural medicine. What will she do to change this balance and to make rural medicine more attractive? Cabinet Secretary. I think Rhoda Grant makes a, a fair point, we have to ensure that the, the skill mix and actually the, the level of um, skill required to work in rural practice, whether that's in primary care or in secondary care, is actually very challenging and sometimes is not as recognised as it should be. I think a lot of good work has been done about recognising rural medicine as a discipline in itself and the sustain, sustainability of the six rural general hospitals has been uh, very much about putting that um, discipline of rural medicine to the fore. I think there is more work we can do around that in helping uh, to recruit and retain staff, and that's something I'm certainly happy to look at in more detail as we take these matters forward. Thank you. Question 11, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support is available to provide public access to fibrillators to communities. Mr Maureen Watt. Increasing the accessibility of public access to fibrillators pads is a key part of our goal to reduce the number of out-of-hospital cardiac deaths. In 2014, the Scottish Government invested considerably in providing pads across Scotland. This included 1 million to install defibrillators in dental surgeries and 100,000 to increase the number of pads available across Scotland's communities. The Scottish Ambulance Service offers support and advice to organisations interested in putting in place a defibrillator. This includes guidance on funding sources, and there is a range of initiatives to provide support for PADS. A key aim of our strategy of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, which was launched in March 2015, is to enable the public to recognise early signs of cardiac arrest and take appropriate action to save lives. To realise this, communities across Scotland participated in the launch of Save a Life for Scotland, which was held last month and provided opportunities to learn CPR. Thank you. Roderick Campbell. I thank the Minister for that answer, but can she advise what training is given to dispatchers at the Scottish Ambulance Services Command and Control Centres regarding the location of PADS and when they should be used? Can she also confirm what procedures are in place to ensure PADS across Scotland are accurately logged into the system? Minister. Yeah, the member makes a, a very good part uh, point and uh, Scottish Ambulance Service is pivotal in the coordination, clinical governments, quality assurance and delivery of much of the response to uh, our uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy. The Ambulance Service has agreed to realise a number of different actions in order to support the successful leadership and implementation of the strategy. A key commitment of the strategy is to optimise systems and training in ambulance control centres to provide a rapid recognition of cardiac arrest, expert support by by, to bystanders in using the pads, and to maintain and extend the community first responder network. Thank you very much. Question 12, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve child and adolescent mental health services. Minister. We introduced the CAMS heat target for faster access to specialist care. This has resulted in significant reductions in time children and young people are waiting to access specialist child and ad adolescent mental health services. We have made available to NHS Board 16.9 million since 2009 to increase the number of psychologists working in specialist camps and we have further committed another 3.5 million this year. 
In May uh, 2015, we announced an additional 85 million over five years for mental health. This is in addition to the 15 million over three years announced in November 2014 for the Mental Health Innovation Fund. Part of this money will go to make further improvements to child and adolescent mental health services and bring down waiting times. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? The Audit Scotland report NHS in Scotland 2015 shows that the 90% target for CAMS was not met in 2015, standing at 81.1% down from 98.5% in 2013 after the changes to waiting times were lowered from 26 weeks to 18 weeks. Whilst reducing the waiting time is a positive step, the Scottish Government is failing young children who suffer from mental health issues unless proper resourcing is in place. And in addition to that, um, of particular concern to me are the 6,000 children a year whose referrals are rejected. Will the Government at the very least undertake an audit of the outcomes for these children? Minister. Well, um, we are disappointed that some NHS boards will not meet the target, but we sh should reflect on the journey that has been taken. We've seen an increase in referrals from 4,734 in June 2012 to 7,077 in June 2015, an increase in the number of children seen uh, from 2,640 in June 2012 to 4,444 uh, in June 2015. So NHS boards are doing a significant amount of work in redesigning their services to increase the capacity to meet the CAMS target on a su sustainable basis. Uh, we do monitor uh, not only those children who are in referral and, and their outcomes, but also we are continue to notice uh, how many are not referred on. Question 13, Sarah Boyer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the cleft pallet unit in Edinburgh will be retained. Yes, because only the specialist surgical element of cleft services is within the scope of the review. All other services delivered by the cleft pallet unit in Edinburgh and the wider cleft network are unaffected and will continue to be delivered locally because only the specialist surgical element um, is uh, part of this consideration. Um, that's uh, why there is a review underway to identify sustainable delivery of high quality specialist cleft surgery in Scotland and of course we have uh, seen the recommendation from the options appraisal group to locate cleft surgery on a single site in Glasgow uh, but of course that doesn't represent a final decision at this stage. Thank you. Sarah Byatt. <coughs> Can I thank the Minister for the clarity of that answer and say to her that parents were absolutely devastated at the decision to remove cleft surgery from Edinburgh. It's a key part of that unit. And would the Minister clarify whether um, there has been acknowledgement of the serious concerns about outcomes for patients with cleft surgery? This is a key issue. People are worried that there will be a damage to patient health and that the Question analysis is. was not carried out Pardon, Presiding Officer? Question. Is the Minister aware that the analysis was not properly carried out to look at those outcomes and that people are very concerned that there was no proper independent review and that parents, patients, staff and stakeholders were not consulted about this decision, which they were reassured would not happen four months ago? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the cleft community across Scotland was consulted on the need for an options appraisal in August and the aim of this consultation was to invite comments not just from clinicians but from patients, families and CLAPA to inform the options appraisal um, exercise. A public engagement meeting was hosted by NSD and supported by CLAPA in October. This engagement highlighted that the options appraisal would consider the configuration of the cleft surgical service only, not other services. NSD has advised stakeholders will have further opportunities to further input before a final decision is made. And of course, the process for that uh, briefly is that the findings from the option appraisal group uh, will be considered by the National Specialist Services Committee on the 9th of December, and they will consider the review findings and make a recommendation on the way forward to board chief executives before the final recommendation is passed to Scottish ministers for decision in the new year. Thank you. Question 14, Gavin Brown. 
Thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to improve outcomes for people who have survived and acquired a brain injury in Lothian. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this year, Scottish Government has provided £40,000 grant funding to NHS Lothian to support a pilot project designed by the Scottish Acquired Brain Injury Network, which aims to ensure that all admitted head injured patients will be cared for by neuroscience clinicians in a dedicated multidisciplinary service. The project aims to deliver recommendations for a systematic rollout of the model across Scotland, which, if implemented, could represent a huge improvement in standards and put Scotland at the forefront of integrated brain injury services. I'm grateful for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that Edinburgh Headway are doing a phenomenal job in this field? And does she share my view that Edinburgh Headway have a vital role to play going forward? Uh, yes, I would agree with that and pay tribute to the work of Edinburgh Headway. Um, they do a fantastic job, as do many organisations working in this field, but uh, they are uh, particular standouts and uh, I hope that they continue to do that work. Thank you very much. We'll go on to question 15 as well. Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with NHS boards regarding planning for winter. Cabinet Secretary, briefly, please. <clears throat> Well, myself and Scottish Government officials have been engaging with NHS boards over the spring and summer period to agree and develop winter planning guidance for 2015. The guidance was issued to boards almost two months earlier than last year. As part of the winter planning process, we met with all boards at a national event on the 17th of September to discuss winter plans and preparations. I have monthly meetings with the chairs of boards and at our last meeting we considered uh, board winter preparations and of course we've allocated over £10.7 million of additional funding this year to help boards uh, prepare for winter. Thank you. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. As the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, NHS Lothian faced a challenging winter period last year. What reassurances can the Cabinet Secretary give the people in my constituency and throughout the Lothians that these challenges will be met this year and going forward? Cabinet Secretary. Well, NHS Lothian and their partners have strengthened their winter planning this year by taking um, an approach across the whole of the health and social care uh, services uh, within the board. Their winter plan sets out how the board and its partners uh, will uh, support admission avoidance and delayed discharge this winter. The board also has contingency plans to open additional staffed acute beds in a managed and orderly way. Um, and the board is also investing in their AHP and imaging workforce to cover seven-day working to support effective discharge. Um, we have certainly learned lessons from last winter in terms of the things that are the, the focus on of the additional monies. And one of those really important elements, not just in Lothian, but elsewhere, is making sure that weekend discharge uh, takes place and also that social care assessments can happen over the festive period. Many thanks. My apologies to those people who have been unable to ask, allow their questions to be asked. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 14859 in the name of Margaret Burgess on an ambitious house.